So, folks, I introduce Ivan Kuzadic, who works for Nokia. He's also very active in the software foundation. He organizes a conference, actually. Uh, Socrates, which is end of August, end of August in the Sochi. So let's just start. So thank you for the introduction. So yeah, I'm deeply involved in software craftsmanship kind of movement in Germany and also organized something for global level. If you're interested in this and software craftsmanship, craftsmanship is all about high quality of coding, like testing things properly, and just making sure that things you implement don't just work but they are actually like maintainable and everything else, please come to our meetup and we actually need people more, uh, with more background in functional programming. So we are kind of weak on that. So you would have the opportunity to teach people new stuff and spread the word, which I think is amazing. But enough about that one. So just a bit about this presentation. It's geared more toward object-oriented programmers. So that means I don't really assume any knowledge of functional programming, of advanced types or anything. It's just kind of slowly going to build uh, on top of some concepts. And uh, it's going to be in Scala. But it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, Scala is just here kind of as a concrete language that's going to be used. Uh, and some of the syntax, of course, is going to be Scala specific. But that's not the important part. The important part are more like uh, underlying ideas. So, the idea is to kind of a bit expand your horizons if you haven't seen some of this stuff to just uh, see what's possible and hopefully apply it somewhere in the future. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, we are a bit time constrained, but please interrupt me with questions and comments. So, I mean, I actually like that, don't mind at all. And I'm going to even invite you at some points where I think there could be more questions to actually join me in. Um, so, presentation has kind of three parts. First is just a bit about types. And by the way, I'm not going to go in type theory or uh, throw definitions out. It's more going to be just like ideas behind it. So it's not going to be strict in mathematical sense, but more like just what are the concepts there. So we're going to have a bit about types. Uh, then there's going to be a small detour in something that's kind of Scala specific, but you can view it as implementation detail for other languages. So even though it's Scala specific mechanism, it helps to explain how to implement type classes in other languages as well. And then finally, the important part is just actually type classes themselves. Um, so basically first, just a bit about types. And I mean, I don't want to define this strictly, but type is kind of classification of data that you have in your programs. So it's used to kind of categorize uh, your data in different semantic units. So it, it helps you determine possible values or domain of the type, uh, what operations are supported, and kind of gives semantic meaning to your data. So it's not just by a group of bytes, it also gives semantic interpretation to your data. And some example of those would be like well, uh, basic data types like real or integer or bool, but also classes in object-oriented program, uh, programs like person or account and so on. Basically, almost any unit you have in a code is actually a underlying has a type uh, underlying it. And so, what we are normally thinking when we talk about types, we are talking about nominal types. And uh, well, nominal types even in the name it says like types are identified by the name. So it's like a nominal. So what this means is that if you know full name of a type, you actually know everything about it. So uh, if you have the full name, and full name just means it's all of, like uh, pre-qualified with uh, package uh, package name, but it, it tells you everything about it. So if you know you have this uh, type object of this name of the type, you know everything about it. You know supported operations. You can infer for that like hierarchy of inheritance and everything else. And the names are so crucial that we even talk about name conflicts. So that's like if you try to import in the same scope uh, two different names, well, it's going to conflict because you cannot have more than one name for a type because names are what identify the type themselves. And so this is like basically what all the standard languages normally do. So like Java, uh, C, C++, actually, but C++, C++ uh, Ruby, Python, whatever. So this is just like a default, uh, default type that you normally use. And now if you go a bit to like Ruby world or Python, so there is this concept of duck typing, uh, which can be explained nicely by the quote from this guy James, who said that basically, when I see a bird that walks like a duck and swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, I call that bird a duck. 
So, and this expresses the idea pretty nicely, which means like uh, on the runtime I have an object. I don't really know what that object is, what type it is. I don't know what I can do with it, but I just try to do something. So if I have an object and I try to call method swim and it swims, well, great, it works. So I'm just going to try it out. The problem is that if it doesn't really support it, I'm going to get runtime exception. But I don't really test anything with that type in advance. And so actually the only part of the type that's kind of checked is the part of the type that's being accessed. So it's big, most often method invocation or like an attribute access of the type itself. And if it's there, great, it works. If not, runtime exception. And so that would be basically what kind of duck typing is, but maybe the example just give a bit better. So uh, this is, I guess, Ruby. And so in the first line, you see like a string, which, on which I call it size, and I get the size of the string, like it has six characters. Uh, if I do the same on the list, I get three back. Well, because it exists, so uh, I just get, get this result. But if I do it in the seventh line, this weirdly kind of written thing, which is just actually float 42, so if I call size on a float, I get runtime exception, and I get basically no method error, undefined method size on the float itself. So that means, I mean, uh, I just try it out, it either works or fails with uh, runtime exception. And so, there are actually some pretty nice things about typing, uh, that typing, like you don't need to specify types which enables you better abstraction and reuse. So if you have it somewhere, even if people haven't like thought how, uh, even if you cannot imagine how it can be reused, if, as long as uh, someone provides you with an object that supports those operations, it's just gonna work. Uh, so it's pretty kind of good for abstraction and reuse, but if uh, compile time checking is your thing, then it, have that, right? So you, the only thing uh, you can do is try it out in runtime, fails or not. And you can of course write unit tests to try to cover all the possibilities, but you still don't get full compiler check, right? which is uh, definitely stronger. So that's just kind of what duck typing is. Luckily, in kind of uh, in static typing, we get something similar, or even better actually, which is called structural types. Now this is opposite of or kind of parallel to the uh, nominal types, uh, where there are, everything is there identified by the name. Here we identify things by the structure of the type. So, and it's fully compiled time check. So what this actually means is like, you are not saying I wanna have this name of the object, that you're, or like this part of inheritance card. You're saying like, if I get an, uh, an object that supports those three methods with these signatures and names, well, it belongs to my type. So type is now not connected anymore to inheritance hierarchy, but it's actually just uh, matched on a structure level. <coughs> so type is, so a certain type of compile time is inspected to see if it complies with required structure or not. So this will make more sense actually with an example. Um, so this is, uh, again, Scala. Uh, so it's a, I mean, uh, pretty uh, completely valid Scala. So in the first line, I just define a type with ID. And basically the thing uh, on the right from the equal sign is the whole definition of this structural type, where I just require any type that has method get ID that returns a string that doesn't take any parameters, uh, will qualify it to be with ID type. So it will, it will kind of comply to this with ID type. And then in the second line, I define uh, a method uh, or a function that's going to use that type. So, uh, I mean, you can for now ignore it, we can discuss it later if you want this kind of t thing and bit ID, but basically what it says is like, I'm going to take any element E that complies to type bit ID. The rest is just uh, standard scala syntax for like basically complying to type, which normally means inheriting from that type. Um, and then on the right side, uh, we can only use uh, we can only use the part of the structure of this E element that complies with our definition of the structural type. So that's why we can call here get ID. And so now in lines number four and five, I define two classes uh, that don't really share any inheritance card. I mean, sure, they inherit from object or any uh, in a Scala. So they have somewhere deep down some common hierarchy, but they don't share any hierarchy that specifies that they sh should have this get ID. So, and this is the full definition of the class. So basically it's like a uh, class named foo that has get ID returns foo and the same for the bar. So in line seven, 
I'm now passing one of those classes, actually, or instance of that class to method ID, and I mean, I just get uh, ID back. So not, nothing too special. But what's interesting is that this uh, method ID works on those two separate types. So it's like, so the, although they don't have a uh, common hierarchy, and there is no interface that they share or anything else, uh, they satisfy the structural type, and that's why I can use them this way. And this is fully checked on compile time. Okay? Um, and so basically what structural types give us is kind of ad hoc grouping of types based on the structure. So it's not based on the inheritance trees or interfaces, mixins, whatever. It's based purely on structure. Um, but it still has some limitations. For example, what if we have a method that does what we want logically? So semantics of the method are uh, compliant to what we want. But the method is just called differently. So maybe you have a signed class instead of spelled out class instead of like plus hours or something. So, and if we don't control the implementation, if we have controlled implementation, maybe we can just change um, one of the implementations to kind of comply to the other one. But if we don't control it, we really cannot do that. So this is basically what structural types are and uh, what are their limitations. Um, so maybe now is a good time to just check if you have any questions. Great, then let's proceed. Uh, so maybe, maybe I have a comment. Right? Yeah, please do. On the duck typing, it says, well, if it, whatever, if it quacks like a duck and blah, 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 and then you call it a duck. But in fact, with duck type, you don't ever call it a duck. No, no, you, I mean, you yeah. logically maybe think it's a duck, but there is no way for you to prove that it's actually a duck. Yeah. Maybe it's a but, goose. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, but in duck type, you don't usually think about the duck. No, no, no. Right? You, I mean, it's just expresses that basically you just pretend that you know how it's going to behave and you do it hoping that it's going to uh, go well. But in the end, you, you just don't really know at all. And this is what structural types give more actually is because as long as it complies to structural type, aside from being compiled and checked, you can require more structure than just invoked method. You can require like seven methods that you need to have in package for this to make sense. Okay? So now I'm actually going to go to something that's kind of scala specific. It's called implicits. And you can think of it as kind of bridge between structural types and type classes. So obviously type classes are going to do everything that structural types do, but a bit more. Um, so basically what implicits are is like, it, they are customs called implicit conversion rules. Now, uh, every language has some implicit conversion rules that are baked into the language. Like in C, you can always pass integer where a long is expected. So this, this conversion is happening always automatically. It's implied. If you see that, it's just going to happen. Uh, similarly, you have in uh, Java, if you have any kind of object uh, uh, being uh, like combined with a string, you'll get back string. So that's going to, it's kind of in language definition that that's going to happen. But what Scala enables you is you can actually define your own implicit conversion rules. And you, they are completely scoped, so you can import those where you need, where you need them and, and where you don't, where you don't import them. Uh, what's extremely powerful is that they can be used in Scala to extend existing types. And so it's almost like creating an adapter or wrapper object, but it actually doesn't copy the object. So it's still the same same underlying object. It's compiler, just, or not compiler, but JVM just kind of notes itself that, well, now this type supports this additional operation. Um, so it will actually make more sense if you see an example. So in the first line, I'm just, this is kind of Java, but of course, all the Scala, which is just like, I'm adding to a string a number and it returns a string. So this is one of the rules that, that's always defined. That's part of the Java language and all those Scala. But in the line number four, I'm saying one, on actually on number one, I'm calling method two and passing argument four. And this looks really weird. I mean, in the end, I actually get like a range of numbers from one to four. But the question is, I mean, how does this work? Does, does, a met, does a, like numbers in Scala have method two? And that's actually not the case. So actually what happens is that something like this is defined in code. And this is again volume Scala, uh, completely, uh, completely self-contained example actually. So the way compiler works is that if you call, uh, on a it's all compile time check. So if you, in a compile time, it sees like you're trying to access a certain method on an object. And that object doesn't support that method. Instead of not compiling or in other, the name language is throwing exception, it would actually uh, check, is there an implicit conversion rule 
from my object, my type, to some other type that, that supports that operation. So it's almost like in Ruby you would have method missing which would be called there, and there you could kind of try different things. This is now scoped to the type itself, where it basically says, look, I haven't found this on your particular type, but maybe I can convert it to a type that supports this additional method. And so this is actually what's happening in this example. So we are basically, uh, this val cell thing is just a constructor with exactly one uh, kind of, uh, uh, one uh, argument in Scala. So we are saying like, okay, uh, create an implicit conversion rule that if you get an integer, uh, add to it operation two. And so if this is in scope, uh, basically all of your integers suddenly support method two. Um, I mean, there are some implementation details here, like you actually need to extend this any while not to create wrapper object and so on, but really not a Scala presentation. But the idea is that like, even though I don't control the definition of uh, numbers, I can add additional functionality to them and extend them. And so that's kind of one part of what implicit term Scala, there are, there are more. And the other part is that you can also define uh, implicit parameter lists. So uh, you can say that like, if uh, something implicit is defined in scope, it will be magically passed wherever it's necessary without you needing to explicitly specify it. And that's all nice and well, and we'll see why is it actually useful, but it's extremely complex. So I mean, uh, this is the, def the definition of how a, a signature of a map function in, in Scala. And so map is this, you have a collection with objects and you apply function to each object and get a new collection. And so this is a full signature of that in Scala, which has four type arguments. You have A, B, that, wrapper. I mean, it's, it's just very complex. And I really like a quote from Peter, who said that basically, whenever is uh, something even slightly ugly in Scala, you introduce an implicit to make it confusing instead. And that's really true. I mean, this is something that's in general actually true in Scala, and that is you can make it as complex as possible, and it can look beautiful, but there is some complexity to pay for it. Um, so you should not overuse them, you should kind of know when to use them because if you overuse them, you can even turn off the type system. I can say like convert anything to, and, and now like a random method, and then suddenly all my objects have a random method, like every single object that exists in a, in a whole uh, program. So there is there needs to be some care in those things. And so that's actually all I have about implicit because well, the rest we can, um, see later, but we finally come to the main idea of the presentation, which is actually type classes. And so, kind of from structural types, what we got there is that we could classify types based on their structure, so they didn't need to inherit something or implement an interface. Uh, and this enables also to add code group types, so we could just say like, okay, those types kind of now can be treated the same way. And what we got for implicit, we kind of could extend the behavior and functionality for existing types, even if we didn't control their implementation. Okay, uh, kind of makes sense so far. Great. So now we come to the confusing part, um, where actually, what what are type classes? Well, Wikipedia says that a, a type class is a type system construct that supports ad hoc polymorphism, and maybe some of you even know what that means. Uh, but on the first look, it's actually pretty confusing. Particular, I mean, uh, depends on your background, but still, like, I don't know. But it's, we can still read some hints from it, like ad hoc. Well, this kind of implies this, like, grouping that we can make on the go. And polymorphism means, like, well, we'll treat maybe some functionality of it the same way. Um, another thing that's pretty kind of confusing is that we have class in the name. Well, type classes, the class there doesn't have anything to do with object-oriented classes. Uh, it's more just like a classification object, a grouping of object, uh, a uniformed way to see things, but it's not really a class in any object-oriented uh, meaning of uh, word. And the way I actually think about them practically, I've seen a more like more powerful version of interfaces. So there are interfaces that can even change and rename the method names and you don't need to implement them, you can just slap them on existing types. And so yeah, so let's see how we actually implement one of those things. And that is basically, uh, it has kind of three steps, and they're gonna make more sense when we see actual implementation. But first you need to kind of define your uh, uh, type class. So that means you just need to 
kind of be able to reference it. So we'll just define it somehow in a code that we can refer to it. And then we're going to create elements that kind of show which types now belong to this type class. So we'll build a relationship between this name of the type class or the reference to the type class and which kind of different types satisfy this type class. And then we are going to implement uh, some algorithm, some functionality, some, uh, 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 some behavior of the code that actually uses the type class itself. And we are going to do that by implicit parameters. Um, so that's actually pretty weird. So let's go to an example and then see if there are some questions. So this is a full implementation of a very, very trivial type class. Where basically in the first line, I'm just saying like, like I'm defining an abstract class called acceptable of t. And now, I mean, for this presentation, you really don't need to care about Scala details there. It's just that I'm defining the name acceptable. So I'm saying like acceptable is going to be my type class. Um, and it even has this uh, type parameter t, which means I'm be able to somehow connect it with a uh, with uh, real existing types, which I actually do in lines three and four. So in line three, I'm defining that like uh, ints can be of the type class that belong to the type class acceptable of t. Because if you have a acceptable of t, so if you have a type with type parameter, it cannot exist on its own. It's not concrete enough. It's, it's generic, but it, it's not a real type. It's just called type constructor. Uh, but if I'm saying that acceptable of int, that's well like saying list of integers. So that's a concrete type that can be created. List of t cannot be created if you don't know if it's inside char or whatever. But if you um, if you have like acceptable of it, that's now a concrete uh, type that belongs to the type class itself. And so I'm here defining basically that uh, integers and longs belong to the type class. And then in line number six, I'm uh, actually implementing like small algorithm that uses those things. And well, algorithm is as trivial as it can be. It's basically a function f that returns you whatever you put into it. So it takes just one parameter t, um, and it returns you that parameter t back. But what we are doing here, we are restricting that this t needs to be of type for which acceptable of that type exists. So this is this implicit evidence of acceptable of t. So we require our type class to exist for this type t. That means just you know, on, on like, not on Scala level, but on a logical level, it just means like type t belongs to the type class. So we are going to operate on the type class operations. And so in line uh, eight, I'm just calling number one for the function. And I get that number back. So, I mean, it's not an amazing functionality, but it's so that it works for, for, for integers. Um, I'm doing similar thing in line number 10 with longs. Uh, where you just get get that number back. But what's interesting is that in line 12, now I'm passing in a double. And you can see that I've specified how ints belong to acceptable and how long belong to acceptable, but I haven't done it for double. And that's why on the compile time, I get uh, a, a compiled error which says could not find implicit value for parameter evidence acceptable of double. What it really means is that there is no evidence that double belongs to the type class. And this is actually where naming becomes so beautiful because we need an evidence that something belongs to the type class. So actually, like name evidence is not chosen, uh, not chosen randomly. Um, so that's actually like a full implementation of a simple type class. I'm going to have more concrete ones that are actually useful for something. But does this make sense so far? Do you have some questions? Okay, great. No questions. Then let's now go to an actual example that kind of does a bit more. So I'm just quickly going to hmm, jump to IntelliJ, but I guess I'll need to migrate the screens. Okay. So, so this is an example uh, that comes from Neofit's Guide to Scala, which is, by the way, amazing series of blog posts, like maybe 12 or 15 of those. Um, that actually uh, explains some pretty interesting concepts. Uh, assuming you don't really know Scala from before, and it's not really concentrating on Scala, it's using Scala to explain concepts. But concepts are in general interesting, like uh, pattern matching, or yeah, things like type classes, or like a lot of other different things that are very uh, interesting and powerful. 
So what the example is trying to do is we are trying to write a statistical library. So we're going to write a library that just you know uh, provides user with uh, statistical operations. You can calculate me means, max, mediums, uh, maybe distributions, and things like that. And so we, as the author of that library, are going to use type classes to kind of specify what can a library operate on. Okay, so let's just let's just see how it all looks like. So again, we have this type class specification. So basically, here in the line. 31, I'm defining like a, a something on a code level called number like of t, which is our actually our type class. So the type class is going to be called number like, and we require that uh, that uh, type class now to support three operations. We require plus, divide, and minus, and you you can see that all those operations are working on this abstract t type. Okay, so that's just definition of our. Uh, what what it means for our statistical library for something to be number like for, for something on which we can actually uh, do statistical calculations um, in real life of course it would probably also have like I don't know, multiplication or something else but it will still be a, only a handful of methods uh, and then in like a line I guess 40 to 50 basically we are again defining which classes belong to our type class so this means like uh, I, as a library author, have needed to recognize that a statistical calculation makes sense for those two classes. So I'm just defining that, like, okay, again, we're defining that uh, doubles can be treated as number like, so doubles support those operations. And I'm implementing, I'm actually saying, like, when you have a double, how do you operate those operations? How do you satisfy them? And so basically, just instead of plus, it's actually using a sign plus. So it's just defining how, how this double relates to operation that the type class supports. And uh, afterwards, it's the same thing is basically done uh, for integers. Um, and then we come actually to the implementation of the statistical library, which is here amazing and has like four different methods, four different operations. So it's those lines 55 to 68. Uh, and basically, this is the part where actually as an author of the library, we are, in, we are using our type class. So we are restricting this, uh, our algorithms to the operation that type class supports. So for example, here you see in line number 58 that how it could implement mean, which is basically given a collection of elements of t, well, uh, calculate their sum, the total sum of it. This is just this XS reduce part. So we get the sum of them, and then we divide them by the, by the size of the collection. So that's how we, uh, and then we access, uh, and then, then, then we get that element back. So that's, that's just how we can implement a mean purely using the operation of this, this library. And the same is now for median, we just access the appropriate element with sorted sequence, and then quartals, and hierarchy, which are like those uh, like, uh, numbers that show how, uh, how at three different points, how the um, distribution looks like. So we can have there hundreds, or actually, I mean, in real life, it will be hundreds and thousands of statistical operations, and they would all be expressed uh, through this dependency on the type class itself. And now, what's interesting is that like someone has uh, uh, written this library, and now you come as a user there, and you see like, okay, I just want to do some statistical calculations, but I don't really have integers and doubles. I'm actually operating on time, so I'm using Joda time. So now, pretend that this is not in the same code, like same file, but I mean this is this is your like library that you don't control, and this is now your client code. And so it lines 72, I guess, till 80. Uh, we are as a client of the library now defining how durations can be treated as number like. How can you operate statistical things on durations? And again, we define just plus divided minus. And for example, you can even see that like authors of Joda time of this duration thing never thought that you could divide durations because well they didn't need it. But we think that you can still do reasonably statistics if by implementing kind of actually um, divide on durations. So this means now, although we don't control statistical library and we don't control the implementation of the objects that we want to do statistics on, we can combine them on the client side to build it. And we can see that in kind of this main method, where basically uh, we are just creating a sequence or I guess vector of durations 
this is just the constructor, uh, kind of just a helper methods to kind of construct duration. But we have like a list of durations, and then in line 22, we are calculating the median of those. And you can see that uh, the call itself looks like this library, statistical library was written for durations. Because you just you just call median of durations. There is no converters. You're not you're not wrapping them in something. Uh, and this gets kind of uh, a minute is just to print something because I'm not getting you know, a duration object. But in the end, it looks completely like the statistical uh, library was written for this type that author never thought should be used with statistics. Uh, and line 23 is just showing you that we can even apply different logical algebras for the statistical library. We can. Uh, we are, here we are passing this, uh, like, in line 23, we are passing this number like duration, which is saying, which is actually saying how durations belong to the type class. So we can have, like, even two different algebras on duration that still makes statistical sense. And that's actually, like, a some, somewhat contrived example, but this is an example of how, like, a, how, would, uh, how would you use type classes. So basically you are, on, on you as an author of some library, of some code, you are, uh, declaring a type class with everything, every operation you need for a library to work. And then client can uh, join that library with who knows which kind of objects and, and kind of combine them together and they will just work. And it will always look like your library was actually written purely for that type. So you will not have any wrappers or anything like that. So do you have questions? Does this now make sense? Is this useful at all? To, like, Ask if you want something. Hmm. Okay, I guess everything makes sense. So then I'll just quickly go back to the uh, presentation itself. Just a second. Okay, so this was basically kind of just a bigger example and it was a bit contrived because biologically we would only have a handful of operations on the type class but you would have hundreds of or thousands of methods that actually use them uh, and so that actually the amount of code that is needed to at attach the, a certain type of type class is extremely trivial compared like three orders of magnitude or more uh, less than it's actually the code of library that you're using and the rest of your code. Um, and it's basically what they enable you is like you can extend existing types and even uh, you can do that even when pure structure doesn't match. So we, can, we saw that like in, in uh, Joda world we could use plus but on integers we use the sign plus. So we can even, they, they semantically do the same thing but like their authors just didn't talk to each other and they never uh, agreed on a common name. So we can basically change the structure on the client side uh, uh, and uh, rename it and, and just attach kind of this interface. And so what's important is there is no need for rep reference on client side. So I mean like, well, as long as the language is turning to complete, you can do anything you want in there, but like, if you, for example, try to do this now in Java, you would need to wrap everything in wrappers and then unwrap it back, and it would also copy, the copy things in memory. Instead of this, this is like using the same objects, there is no copying around, there is no uh, runtime performance, this is all checked on compile time. So it all looks for you like the library was written for that type itself, and not that it was written in some generic way um, uh, that enables you this functionality. So now, kind of to check again, what are those type classes? Well, kind of fairly, they are ad hoc polymorphism adding constraint type variable in parametric polymorph types. Now, this doesn't make sense, I mean, like, uh, this is just like a random, you know, like random string of words and we can analyze them and it's kind of true, but that's not really what matters to me today here. What matters is that you, you kind of see where they could be used, or why do they enable some abstraction, a higher level of abstraction. And so I think of them kind of as a more powerful version of interfaces that can be attached to types without modifying, to types that you don't control, um, and without any penalties of on runtime. And now the question is like, well, what could I else use? I mean, everything can be solved in some other way as well. And I mean, if you are a fan of uh, design patterns, uh, you'll probably use adapters. 
But basically, with adapters, you will be exposed the way to handle this wrapping, unwrapping. It will copy things. It will just not feel natural on client side. Because, well, in the end, library was not really written for you. It was written for this other object that you are wrapping it to and off. Um, and on the other hand, if you are in a Ruby world, uh, you could use monkey patching to augment types whose source you don't control. So many, I don't know if you know what uh, monkey patching is, but basically in Ruby you can just, uh, even if you don't control the type, you can just open it, mess around with it, change its structure, add new methods, and close it back. Um, so it's extremely powerful, but it, this, the, this is all checked in runtime, so you don't have any compile time saving. Um, so yeah, so to kind of conclude, uh, you should use type classes for better abstraction and reuse. And I highly encourage you to check this like Neopy's guide uh, to Scala or any other resource and just uh, kind of get an idea of what's possible in other languages because a lot of those ideas, even if they're not directly written for your language, kind of expand your thinking and you can do more in your original language. And this is actually all I have. So I like this topic and similar topics. So if you want, you can contact me in these places and hopefully you have some questions. Great, that means everything was pretty clear. Yeah. So it kind of it kind of whizzed past me that you said there's no runtime impact. Yes. Right? So. But but if you have a true JVM interface, yeah. then you know, get, I, I would think you would still get more efficient dispatch than if so, you have I mean for the type class you need to pass an additional object, that object will need to be constructed in the first place. No, so it's not actually it's not I mean Okay, so this is now really completely to the details of the JVM implementation itself. Uh, but what, what actually happens is like compiler marks that this like this now supports additional operations. So it's not construct a new object because we are not adding new data to the object itself. It doesn't have any data fields. It just supports a new operation on existing data fields. So so it, the, the dispatch table will change slightly, but it will still use directly that dispatch table. It will, it will not look in multiple places. It will just know that this is augmented. No, no, but it looks in an object, in an additional object, and that object may be constructed, right? Yeah, but this object is constructed, uh, I mean, uh, on a class loading. Uh, so I mean, it's this impact on the when it's when it's also. If, if, if there's no, if you have like a straight, um, if you have a straight type class, then you have a straight type class, then you have a straight type class, then you have a straight type class, yeah, but I mean, what we are, con we are, so we are, we are not constructing one object per instance of the type class. We are just noting that whole type class, a whole category of objects, or type, original type supports additional operations, because we are. And this is what in the presentation. This is where we have, it, and it's very specific to so in Scala. But uh, if we go back to implicit, this is actually the magic that is enabled by this eval. So this is a special construct that says like. Uh, I'm only going to take var argument. I'm not going to change to it like internal behind. I'm not going to add new fields to it or anything. I'm just going to use that original object, and I'm just going to note in that scope. And, and implicits are completely scope. They have only, their own scoping rules. That's why I mean, they are actually pretty complicated. They are one of the 13 phases of uh, 30 phases of resolution of Scala code is uh, actually checking implicits, and it's one of them that usually takes the longest. But it's just like for all this like package. Or for all this scope that we have, they, it compiler kind of notes we can now support this additional operation. So it augments. I mean, you can think of it as augmenting the dispatch table for those objects, but it's not on object itself. But I mean, the, but this is the whole. It, I think you kind of missed the point, which is which is that a lot of type classes are not just like the, the ones that you showed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they have a prerequisite. They have something. I guess the analog of, of inheritance. Yeah, exactly. They can have so a that means right. that your type class is really is not an object, but it's a function that takes another object, which might be yeah, exactly. In those in those cases, the penalty is of right. course, exactly, because then you cannot express it to this constraint of any value anymore. Yeah. I'm just saying that uh, for just adding pure functionality, you don't need to have that. But if you want to express additional things, then you need to have additional things. Yeah, yeah I agree. Sorry, I didn't follow the time. Uh, any other question? Well, thank, thank you very much. much.